your idea of retirement. It's reality for some, but it can't continue. Tonight, is it time to face reality? You thought you've got a comfortable retirement to look forward to? Think again. Tonight, we explore what has to happen if the idea of retirement, indeed, we ask whether the whole principle of the state paying people not to work is doomed. Why should younger people remain wage slaves so older people needn't? The sums don't add up. There are too many old people and too few young people working to support them. Something has to give. Dream on, young people, if you think a retirement like this will be yours. Whereas it used to be the case that the next generation, the up-and-coming generation, tended to be more prosperous than their parents, now we're going to be in reverse. It's going to be their parents that are more prosperous than the next generation. With a cast ranging from the sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation, to the lean and slippered pantaloons and those who defy medical science, we'll explore the options. It won't necessarily be either easy or comfortable. Should we start, for example, by coming up with some new role models? A million people are reckoned to have been on the street demonstrations in France today, outraged at plans to raise the retirement age to 62. What planet are they on? Here, the government's planning on raising the age to 66, then probably to 68. Everyone agrees. We can't go on as we are with people in work having to pay more and more in taxation to support people who could just as easily, perhaps, be working themselves. First tonight, our economics editor, Paul Mason, with a reality check. Some people look back on it as a golden age. From the 1960s to the 1990s, people actually thought it was their right to give up work only two-thirds through their lives. They'd enjoy long periods of something called retirement. We now look at it as unsustainable. By the year 2030, the whole concept of retiring from work might indeed be the stuff of the history documentary. And if you want a vision of the future, well, there's one place they're already living it. What's called the demographic time bomb is about to explode. In 1989, B&Q launched an experiment to run a whole store with workers aged over 50. At the time, it was seen as quaint, philanthropic even. It's given me a lot more confidence. It's given me my confidence back, in fact. Fast forward to the present, and the whole brand and business model now relies on grey power. Yeah, just give the gentleman a bag. Yeah. And the word elderly seems somehow wrong. Barry and colleague Elizabeth were in high-powered jobs once. Both are now revelling in their second career. Last week I got promoted to supervisor, um, which ain't bad, my age. Um, next step is manager, if, if I wanted it. But, you know, that's my choice. Yeah. The company don't stop us. And every day is a school day. Doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're... You've just come in the company at 16, or you've come in at 65. It's up to the individual, it's up to the individual how far they want to go up in the company. For B&Q's Director of Human Resources, the whole strategy of employing older workers brings nothing but advantages. I think for us, it's having people who've got a whole set of life skills. So we've got a really great mix in the store between our older workers who've got experience of serving customers, and quite often experience of DIY, and they can be great mentors to our younger employees. So I think there's a sort of family feel about a B&Q store. But with the crisis of the current pension system, many over 60s may be forced into work like this. B&Q have been employing older workers for more than 20 years, but now a combination of economics and demographics means this could become the norm. The post-war baby boom caused a bump in the workforce that's now begun to shrink. It was the same story in the USA and Europe. In the rising phase, we called it the demographic dividend, but the rising phase is over. What the baby boomers did was they congregated in the workforce in 
incredibly large numbers. Uh, production was higher, uh, education expanded, savings were bigger, consumption was stronger, and we call this the demographic dividend because it's a phase when child dependency declines because of weak birth rates, the working age population grows very substantially, and it's before old age dependency starts rising. Unfortunately, this demographic dividend has now been exhausted. It's over. The post-war baby boom fueled the rise of mass affluence in the 1960s. This, in turn, made pensions possible for the masses. While only a minority of workers ever had company pensions, in the era of big spectacles, their fortunes were intimately linked to that of the stock market. After the Second World War, it became an article of faith in the city of London that if you put your money into shares and left it there a long time, it would grow fast enough to support you in retirement. But after two boom and bust cycles in a decade, that is no longer true. This graph shows the value of the UK stock market over the past half century. It ticked up gently in the 60s and 70s and then raced upwards in the Thatcher era and kept going, prompting many companies to believe in the 90s their pension schemes were actually doing too well. But if you measure it from the year 2000, the trend line is not encouraging. The, the retirement system becomes increasingly non-viable, partly because of the extraordinary length and rise in life expectancy partly because equity returns now look much less attractive in the future than they used to, and partly because interest rates are so low, uh, particularly on gilts, for example, that it's almost impossible for people to transfer their uh, retirement pots into annuities and live off the income. So we, we've reached a kind of a juncture where there has to be wholesale rethinking, rebooting, if you want to use modern parlance, about the nature of retirement and how we perform that function in society. With both state and private pensions now under pressure, politicians have struggled to bite the bullet. It was Labour that first suggested raising the retirement age, but it remains worried about the implications. Some people do very, very tough manual jobs that are very physical, and they're not going to perhaps be in the same uh, circumstances those in, uh, in white-collar jobs to carry on working later into the, their, uh, what would have been their retirement. Over the next 40 years, the cost of sorting out the financial crisis will come to a mere 29% of today's GDP. But age-related spending will come to 335% of GDP, and it's not an either-or. If we are about to see the end of the concept of retirement, then a 100-year-old social contract is broken. And we may look back on it with nostalgia. By 2020, the retirement age was a thing of the past. The old system collapsed, though it did not go quietly. Well, let's talk, off, uh, talk first off about uh, whether retirement, as we know it so far, is dead. Ros Altman, do you think it is? Well, I certainly think it should be. Uh, the way we consider working lives at the moment is just not sustainable. We have to rethink the way we treat older people and the way older people think about themselves. There's so much age discrimination, but people should be able to work longer if they want to, if they need to. At the moment, it's just not working out in, in the labor market, but we should help them work part-time, not full-time, so that they have a better lifestyle as well. Just rethink the whole thing. Okay, that's your perspective as a pensions expert. Yep. As a historian, Pat Lee, has the situation in which we've found ourselves for the last 20, 30 or more years been actually an aberration? Well, there's been a lot of change over the last 50 or 60 years, certainly, because more people are living longer. Um, so many more people need pensions for much longer. The other thing that's changed quite dramatically is that people stay healthy longer. And so more people are able to be active to later life. Not everybody. And people are very variable in their fitness at later ages. But if we were inventing a retirement age now, we wouldn't make it 65. Well, would We'd we make, make it, it later. 
Well, I think a flexible retirement age, which is what Beveridge actually wanted when he made his proposals in 1942, he wanted a flexible pension and a flexible pension age. See, Steve Webb, now you're the, the pensions uh, minister, and I know you're going to say you're looking into all of this. But actually looking into it when you've already committed to 66 or 68 does not seem a very radical proposal. Well, the first thing we've done is said that the law which currently allows you to be sacked for the crime of being 65 is going to go. And I've even today had people say to me, oh, you've got to take it steady, don't rush it. We've got to get on with it. We've got to change the attitude, as Ross says, that says, just because, you know, five years' time, Jeremy, imagine the BBC come to you and say, sorry, you may be a brilliant broadcaster, but the date on your birth certificate says you're no use anymore. That's a nonsense, and we're going to ban that within the next 12 months. That's the first thing. But the second thing is to then say, yes, people can work on past pension sure. age and not be penalised for it. Because at the moment, if you've got a small pension and you want to work a bit and top it up, the benefit system claws all that money back off you, and that's a nonsense. So more flexibility and less discrimination. Paul well, Hutton, do you get the impression that the mainstream political parties are really properly sufficiently engaged with this? Um, no. I mean, I think that uh, actually the baby boomers uh, should be taking a big share, a much bigger share, of the pain that actually is required uh, in the next few years. And one of the things that should happen is a much faster approach to introducing a higher threshold for retirement. Um, and so what do you think ought to be you know, the pensionable age? I think that I, th I personally think the pensionable age should be um, 70. And I think we should get there um, over a 20, 25 year period. Um, life expectancy is such that um, no country, no economy can afford uh, to have a situation in which you, know, um, you, can, you work for 40 years and you're in retirement for 25 or 30 years. It's just too big a burden on the people in work and you yourself cannot accumulate sufficient savings um, to actually get a pension that will allow you to have a worthwhile retirement. So I think we are going to move progressively to 70 uh, and it could even be higher uh, before 2050. I mean, it's only at 70. You're nodding, Ros Altman. You, I mean, you think it's going to be somewhere around there, 70, 75. Well, in the next 20, 25 years, life expectancy could well have increased by more than another five years. So you would still be running to, to stand still or even going backwards. I just think we have to think again about the whole concept. Let's invent this new phase of life that's out there to be grasped with part-time work. You know, it's not one day you're working full-time, the next day you're on a pension and not working. People need to cut down gradually in their 60s okay. and in their 70s. We're going to come to what the, this, some of this means for, for, for people who are actually you know, about to enter the labour market or are young in the labour yeah, market. Of course. But for someone like you, Eric Morbrook, you are now, you're an engineer and you're in your mid-50s. 58 nearly. Right. <clears throat> so if the re pension age was to go up to 70 or something, mm -hmm. uh, what would you think about it? Well, I think I'd have a raw deal. Um, I Why? started work at 15, which is uh, that the school leaving age uh, for 16 didn't come in until uh, 1972. So anybody born before, uh, anybody left school before that, most probably left at 15. I'll, I will have done 50 years continual working, fortunately, yes, paying into the system, national insurance, tax, everything like that. <clears throat> I've worked all those years, and I think I'll have done enough 50 years. I think that gentleman there said 40 years. I'll have done 50 at 65. Do you, I do think you, it's coming too early. Do you, do you feel betrayed? Yeah. Yes. It's a very strong word to use, and I put it into your mouth, but do you, is that how you feel? Yes, definitely. I think it's coming too early. I think the proposals to come in in uh, 2016 is far too early. And just, just to be clear, we've said no change earlier than 2016 because there's a yeah. balance about giving people adequate warning, you know, when people are close to pension age, to and then sort of yeah. keep moving the goalposts away. So there's already legislation to move to 68. That was passed in the previous parliament, and I think that's too slow. The pace for moving to 68 is too slow, yeah. but there is an issue about because it's 2046 is when we're due to hit 68. Now, that will mean an un, you know, a pension age rising three years in well over a century with life expectancy having gone, you know, out of sight. So we do need to move faster. That's what we call radical action from a radical government. Well, it's too slow. I'm sorry, I disagree. I think it's far too quick. 